hired to provide uh, some type of appointed attorneys to individuals who are uh, charged under a criminal uh, type of an ordinance. So most ordinances have a penalty provision that says that it is a civil infraction as opposed to a criminal penalty. Um, the, the big thing is that whoever is going to do the enforcement really has to be meticulous in, in their work. I mean, they have to go out and they have to determine that whatever is on the site meets the definition of blight that is in the ordinance. The, the person is probably going to have to document that by photograph or video, which is easier today than it was just a few years ago. Um, they're going to have to appear in court for pretrial proceedings and they'll have to be available to testify if the case goes to a trial in front of the judge. So that individual, you know, will have quite a bit of responsibility and it will be up to them to really um, maintain the records of each violation. The other thing that everybody needs to understand is <clears throat> that you cannot, once you put an ordinance on the books, you can't selectively enforce that ordinance. Uh, in other words, if the township board does not like me, but they like my neighbor, and my neighbor has a pile of, of junk, and I have a pile of junk, and the, the, the enforcement officer is told to go out and cite me and not cite my neighbor, that's a problem, okay? And so basically, it has to be enforced uniformly within, within the township. And um, at present, there, Aloha Township has a blight or a specific blight ordinance. It is the only township that I'm aware of that does in fact have a specific blight ordinance. Tuscarora Township has an, an ordinance on the books that, that deals in a peripheral way with blight, but it's not specifically, as far as I recollect, a blight ordinance. And yeah, Burt Township has there. And, and Burt Township enforces its blight through its zoning ordinance. It does not have a specific blight ordinance either, but it enforces the removal of blight through the zoning ordinance. Um, so th those are the only two townships currently that really have any semblance of a, a, a blight abatement. Now there's, there's also been some discussions, and, and I know some of the board members here participated in a meeting. There's a, there's a group that gets together that, is, that consists of the board members from the township of Inverness, Benton, townships of Inverness, Benton, and Beaugrand, and a representative from the city of Sheboygan. And they have a group, and there's been some discussion at that level about trying to put together a uniform ordinance that could be used uh, by all of the townships where the judge, you, you really are potentially gonna have some issues if you have 19 different blight ordinances and Judge Barton has to look at 19 different definitions of blight. So there's been some discussion about trying to get some uniformity and get one ordinance in place where all the townships could, could participate in using one form of an, of an ordinance. But that has not gone anywhere. I know at this point, Bogrand Township has talked about their desire to have their own separate independent blight ordinance. They've not adopted one yet, but it has been under discussion. Uh, at that level. Um, and I, that thought the, I thought the issue with the kind of consortium group was the cost of the enforcement. Well, I don't know that I, I, I don't know that it is the main issue. I but mean, the idea behind the consortium would be to cut down on the cost, right. to potentially have one individual that could be hired by multiple municipalities to, to do the prosecution of the ordinance, to do the enforcement of the ordinance, and to have one ordinance that a judge could look at so that you would not have you know, 17 or 18 different types of ordinances. The other thing too that is a hot button issue, and I, I think it has a lot of validity, is that most of our townships are, are rural in nature and there's a lot of farming activity. And so you have to be careful uh, in terms of how you're defining blight because you know every every farmer's 
pile of steel is a is a, it's a it's a parts warehouse, you know, for equipment and so on and so forth. And there's been a great deal of hesitancy on at least two townships' parts to, to deal with anything that could potentially or negatively impact on agricultural pursuits. And you also have to be careful because your blight ordinance has to take into account the fact that, you know, there isn't the Michigan Right to Farm Act. So if you try to say, well, you can't keep your old baler out in the field more than, you know, two weeks out of the year, I think you might have some real problems in terms of enforcing something like that. So um, there's a lot of issues that, you know, that come up. Now, shifting gears just a little bit, there's a, there's a separate breed of cat that's really not a blight ordinance, but <clears throat> there's, there are what are called dilapidated buildings ordinances. And those are similar to blight ordinances in that the intent is to clean up or to remove buildings that are buildings with it, including residences or structures generally, which could include barns, garages, etc which are dilapidated and which pose a safety hazard to um, individuals. And so those types of ordinances are, um, can be drafted and those are very, very heavy on procedural due process. In other words, if, if a township enforcement officer saw a building that was basically dilapidated and wanted to cite that individual, there's, a, there's a, an appeal process that's built right into the statute where individuals get notice of that, they have the right to come before the board and have a hearing on it. Um, <clears throat> if the board sets up a separate type of entity to have the hearing, the individuals that are on that board have to have specific qualifications, like they have to have knowledge as far as um, being a, a builder, uh, engineering knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So dilapidated building ordinances are uh, ordinances that basically uh, can, you know, clean up uh, problem buildings, but it, it is something that you've got to be prepared to, to put the money into to have the, an appeal panel ready to hear those, you know, those types of appeals. Because people will come in and they, they, will, they will not want their building torn down. They will want time to fix their building up. And the question will be, you know, can the building be fixed up? And you're going to have to have qualified people sitting on your appeal board that will be able to say, you know, this building can be fixed or it can't be. May I ask something? Sure. Wouldn't that be the responsibility of Sheboygan County zoning if we have the buildings like that? No, that, that doesn't fall within the purview of zoning. It would potentially fall, um, you know, uh, in the health department end of it, you know, if you had a, a situation where, you know, a building was falling down. The building code allows for uh, addressing what, uh, unsafe buildings. Yes. And we do have a building enforcement. At the county level. At the county level. Yeah. Well, and we've had an example of that. Right. So we've had an example of it being enforced. When it it these are the trained people are usually with the county. But just for dilapidated buildings. For not, or yeah, unsafe they buildings. Under construction code. Well, construction code is, is there to give permits for new buildings. Yeah. Okay. Right. I think yeah. that's about I think exactly. that's the if, 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 if in fact, if in fact, if the county was really regulating that, you, you would not see the buildings that we see on our roads, you know, if you drive around. The, the unsafe building, from experience, I can tell you that's a tough deal. Tim is absolutely right. It's a tough thing to deal with. And when the letter goes out, you even after somebody has served an official condemnation of a building, you cannot order the building torn down. You give the option torn, uh, demolished, or repair. Uh, that's that, that's the option. That's basically what Tim's saying with the appeal process. But the code does have a section in it for unsafe buildings. Uh, it's just tricky one to try to enforce, just like the blight ordinance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it might be easier if we had uh, a dilapidated building 
ordinance separate from the construction code. Well, and that's why I was saying I don't necessarily look at blight as being a dilapidated building. What, I, what I'm talking about when I think of blight is, you know, something visible outside, you know, scrap cars, scrap metal, garbage, you know, that, that's what I'm thinking of in terms of blight. So. Are vehicles a whole other deal? Mm -hmm. No, not necessarily. I mean, the county of Sheboygan does have a junk car ordinance, okay, but they probably shouldn't. That probably should be regulated more more appropriately under the local. Because I know Indian River a couple of years ago went through and got rid of all right. the junk vehicles that were around. Right. So they must have had some kind of. Tuscarora may have its own ordinance that pertains to that. Okay. So in other words, you don't have to have a junkyard license to have 12 cars in your yard with no license on. There's nothing you can do about that as a... You can call, uh, we, we call the sheriff, or the, um, the, what's his name, Steve Schnell, and they've actually removed some cars because they can, the city of Sheboygan can remove junk cars from any anybody's property and they have moved them, but they will not move cars that have historical license plates on them. Antique license, Antique license plates. Right. Even though they may be junk, they mm -hmm. still can't move them. That's against their ordinance or whatever they have. But that's for the township. I think junk cars and unsafe well, buildings are the, two things that they they are supposed to regulate. They they, well, have, they do been, have an ordinance. That's yes, right. yeah. they have enforced uh, of removal of cars in Mullet Township. Yeah. We had a, quite a collection of, of junk cars near the corner of uh, Birchwood and Richardson Road a number of years ago, and they made that individual remove all the visible cars. I understand that there's still cars back in the woods, but but everything that's visible from the road well, and has been removed. The very point ones got removed. Right. Which they didn't, they just talked to the people. So I, I do think that they are, if we get them the information, we can do the junk car thing through them, but mm -hmm. I don't think that's the answer to the blight. Is my definition of blight is the same definition you have junk blight. It's not just junk cars; it's <coughs> garbage and trash and mm -hmm. you know unsightly, unsightly stuff. Yeah. So. Right. But the thing that from the meeting that you and Marianne both referenced that really came away scaring people on the blight ordinance was the thing that you started out with, how do you define it? Because boats that weren't used within the last calendar year are defined as blight in some of these ordinances. A vehicle that hasn't moved in six months is defined as blight. A camper trailer that hasn't moved within the last year is defined as blight. You know, those those kind of things are are over the top ridiculous, you know, to to most people because you know, not everybody uses their camper every year. And uh hunting cabins fell into that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well I think I think what if we write a blight ordinance, we'll write it without you know, making sure that we don't have those things in there. I think I, I was reading, I've gotten several blight ordinances, and there's this one blight ordinance, which I really like, from Springdale Township in Emmett County, and they have an intent statement, which, you know, it's it talks about these kind of things, like not to interfere with the normal good practice operations of farm, farmlands, and forest. This ordinance does not apply to motor-driven equipment, which is unlicensed, but being used entirely for off-highway work on lands owned agricultural. I mean, that kind of statements to me, um, you know, I mean, they're trying to identify here, so and prevent normal good practice of fuel, fuel, wood, and or lumber intended for building projects new and used. I mean, you know, they've really gone after the intent of trying not to, I, I, I like what they've done. I mean, I, I really, and then they went into what were their factors of light, and it's, it's, Junk, trash, rubbish. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, building materials, incomplete buildings, auto parts, equipment, and machinery. You know, but it talks about what it specifically is. I mean, it's it, they've done a really damaged or unused buildings, and they've done a heck of a of a job, in my opinion, on being very, very specific. I'm not saying that I'm supportive of it one way or the other, but I just really like 
what some of them have addressed. I mean, I think there's possibilities to address things that, if it's done well, you know, will take into account rural areas and issues that, that we might have here. You know, because I know, I think we've got kind of two levels of issues. But anyway, sorry, Tim, I don't want to. No, that, that was primarily, you know, what I wanted to point out, that, you know, the, the blight type enforcement, <clears throat> as long as it's done uniformly, it's not done arbitrarily and capriciously, those are the buzzwords that the lawyers always use. Um, and, and it's not done selectively. Um, you know, blight, can, blight ordinances can work, you know. And, and one of the things that ALOA did years ago when theirs was drafted is they had a, uh, they had like a moratorium and they had, they, they sent a letter out to everybody and said, we're doing a blight ordinance and if you have junk uh, that falls within this definition, if you get it off your property within the next six months or whatever, you know, we're not going to, we won't be coming out to write you a ticket. And a lot of people just voluntarily got rid of the stuff that was going to um, be a problem, you know. And <clears throat> probably 40% ended up hauling it out. And then you had some that after they got sighted, they moved the blight, it was cleaned up, and then you had a, a few that were hardcore and had to be talked to a few times, but you know, that usually, if you do some type of a moratorium and let people know this is coming, you know, and you need to clean this up. The other thing too is that, you know, if you have, if you have cars that are historical cars or whatever, you know, there's nothing wrong with having those types of things, but, but again, it would not be classified as blight if it was within a building. You know, if you had a barn or a garage or something like that, and you put your vehicles in the barn or the garage and you want to keep them, then you're not going to, the township isn't going to regulate what is within those buildings. You know, again, unless the buildings are falling down or whatever is in there is visible or creates a hazard. But generally speaking, um, in Burke Township, we had that situation where somebody had automobile parts and so on, and but they had a barn and they ended up putting, you know, putting all this, this stuff within their pole barn, you know, so. What's the, outside. Um, What's the average time it takes from the time that somebody gets, you know, ticketed if they aren't cooperative? You mean to uh, to prosecute for to go yes. through the court system? Right. Well, generally speaking, if the ticket is issued and it's turned over to the court, the, the and if it's a civil infraction, the judge will send out a notice of pretrial uh, within within a week. The, the notice will go out. Usually the pretrial itself is approximately two weeks after the notice goes out. Um, at the pretrial, there's an attempt to resolve the case where there's a discussion and so on and so forth. And then if it does not get resolved at the initial pretrial, I know that on criminal matters, Judge Barton has a first pretrial and a second pretrial. But on civil infractions, I believe she only has one pretrial and then it is set for a formal hearing or a trial in front of the judge. So normally, uh, you would expect that after that initial pretrial, the actual trial would probably be about 45 days at the outside. So you're talking maybe three months before yes. you have a, a decision on what needs to be done. Right. And, and when you usually give the person some period of time once you, they get the first ticket, or they get warnings ahead of a ticket, or? Well, I've always believed that somebody should be given a warning. You know? So do you have like two two warnings or something like that? Process? Well, that would be up to the enforcement officer. I see. You know? okay. But again, you know, so if, if the enforcement officer goes out and the person says, get the heck off my property, I don't ever want to see you again, well, maybe you don't give the second warning, you know. Yeah. But, if they, but, if, but if they say, you know, yeah, I, I need some time to clean up, you know, I, I had some health problems or whatever, then you know, you try to work with folks. To so you give the, you give the police power, so to speak, to this light enforcer? I mean, this is not a board, you don't have to bring it back to the board every time? Or do no, you no, to? no, you would not bring it back to the board. I mean, you would set policy to say, we want this ordinance enforced. Right, and that's you know, what they do. And that's what they do. And the board's not involved with any of this? No, not generally. Yeah. 
yeah. other than you may be a conduit if you get a, a complaint yeah, right. from the public yeah. that yeah. you know so and so has got so some right. some light you would potentially refer that to the officer and do you have any idea of the cost the general cost of a flight enforcer of a i have no idea i i that was are one of police officers or are they no they wouldn't have to be police officers i mean they could be retired police officers or they could be off-duty police officers but they they would not have to be mm -hmm. you know you would, but they don't carry a gun or anything no, like that no. yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm just asking. Probably should. They probably should. Yeah. I should. Yeah. I mean, you know, I suppose that you know, an enforcement officer could have a concealed Weapon pistol forbidden. license or yeah. something like that. You know, but that wouldn't be something sanctioned by the municipality. You know, I mean, you wouldn't say, you know, you, you need to have a concealed pistol license to be our enforcement officer. Yeah. You know. You, you want to probably remove that from the equation. And there would be qualifications that, that are available to what an enforcement officer would you'd be looking for? Well, yeah, I, I mean, again, I think, you know, you need a details-oriented individual right. that's going to, you know, ha have the, the ability to communicate with people, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and not, not dictate.